Hello, and welcome back to our podcast at Get Legally Speaking. Our legal conversation today will be on introducing the Bar Council in 2021. I am joined by the new chair of the Bar Council, Mr. Derek Sweeting QC. Derek's practice is focused on contentious civil litigation and advisory work in the High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, as well as arbitration. He is regularly instructed by the Attorney General in recent years and in particular in relation to claims arising from the Iraq War. He is a bencher of Middle Temple. He chaired the Legal Services Committee of the Bar Council, was Vice Chair of the Bar in 2020, and Derek is now the Chair of the Bar Council for 2021. Derek, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Oh, it's a pleasure, Hattie. Thanks for inviting me. So, the Bar Council in 2021. Um, I read some really interesting statistics, actually, that in 2020 there was approximately 35,000 barristers and judges in employment in the UK, um, compared with 24,000 in 2019. I mean, that's over a 31% increase there from 2019 to 2020. So, it's great to see that the Bar is growing. Yeah, well, it is. I'm not quite sure where the figures come from, actually, well, or where I... you read them. But, uh, but yeah, the bar is. Uh, we there are concerns about whether the the effect of the pandemic is going to mean that people are leaving the bar. But yes, the bar has been growing in recent years. Yes, no, indeed. I mean, I have to say, I was quite staggered by those statistics because I thought that's a 31% increase during a pandemic, really, where, you know, March last year, the pandemic started in full force on the 23rd with the lockdown. But can you please tell us a little about yourself and your career so far, Derek? Yes, well, I I didn't come from a, a legal background. I suppose that's the thing that people usually ask you. Did you have a path into the law as a result of a family connection? And it wasn't the case for me. Um, my my parents were both teachers, and in fact, had come from very working class backgrounds, and had been the first in their families to go to college or university, and so on. And I was more or less a second, in fact. So um, so progress in a way, but certainly social mobility. And I thought about the bar when I was at school as a teenager, I suspect because I'd seen things on TV like Crown Court, like a lot of people did. And that sparked my interest. And I got what I think in the 70s was a pretty normal reply, which was that the bar wasn't really for you because you had to come from a particular background. Yeah, my teacher told me that. And my form master said, um, really, you need to go to Oxford or Cambridge. You need to be able to support yourself for a few years and surely you should think of something else so I mean I think in fact I I owe that discouragement um, to the fact that I was then encouraged to to go to the bar and I was pretty determined to do it because as with all those things when you're a a teenager someone telling you you can't do something is often the spur and although I couldn't do anything about the lack of finance um, given my family circumstances I did think about going to Oxford or Cambridge and I don't think I'd have thought about that unless I'd been told it was it was a good thing to do if you wanted to get to the bar. And I did go to Cambridge from a comprehensive in Essex, which didn't normally send people there, I think, because I I thought that was something I should do. I mean, I'm glad that's changed. I mean, we don't we don't have that view of people coming to the bar now. And I'm not sure it was even true at the time, but um, I certainly had a good time at university and enjoyed it. And it was a was a helpful sort of route into the bar and had a very good law degree at um, at Cambridge. Well, so that, yeah, that's extraordinary. And I have to say, I totally didn't expect you to say that any of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I to- and I get it. I mean, you know, you were discouraged, and that spurred you on. And what an extraordinary place to start, because as I said, you're you're the you're now the chair of the bar council. Clearly, an extraordinary career so far. Um, and I just didn't expect you to say that. So that that's just thrown me back. But how great and and how inspiring actually, because you're talking about in the seventies. So to really stand up to teachers in the seventies. Um, sorry, I'm not trying to say that was light years away, but it was a complete. You know, it was a different era. Um, is is definitely something to be admired. I'd say to, to you know the very least. Okay, so tell us what what your main reasons are for wanting to be elected as the chair of the Bar Council. What inspired you? And why did you want this position? Well, I've had quite a sort of varied career at the Bar. I mean, it's kind of following on from what I was just telling you, really. I mean, when I, I got to the Bar, 
I I really couldn't think about doing um, work at the bar without being in the Crown Court, you know, wearing a wig, doing murder trials eventually and that sort of thing. That was my conception. And that's more or less what I did. In fact, mostly on the Midland circuit. So I got to see a lot of the country that I hadn't seen before coming from the southeast and London and Essex in particular. So a lot in Birmingham and Lincoln and Nottingham and so on. And I did that for a good long time. I then changed course a bit and ended up doing a, a work that was a lot more commercial. And then more recently, I've done a lot of clinical negligence work, mostly for, for people who've had babies who've been injured at birth and so on, as well as work for the government around the Iraq war and damages claims brought against us. So I've had that sort of varied career at the bar, which I think has given me an insight into quite a lot of areas of practice. And I got involved in the Bar Council when I began to think that some of what we were seeing as, as changes were actually a mark of decline, not in all areas, but they were they were pretty significant challenges, really, not just to the Bar, but to our justice system as a whole. And I, I thought I ought to try and do something about it, if only a little. And I got involved in the Bar Council at that point and started to work on one of its its main committees the legal services committee and found that work fascinating and interesting became the chair and then i think i felt as i've always thought that if you are in a position to step into a role which you think you could perform and it's an important one then you should put yourself forward and that's really the position i i found myself in when i put myself forward for vice chair and then chair of the bar Wow, interesting. Goodness. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's really interesting the points that you're some of the points that you're making are very interesting because it now is a few things are adding up in my head certainly and certainly when we come on to another question that I have here it's going to make more sense when I say what I'm about to say without giving the question away too early. So, what are your goals as chair of the bar council for 2021? I mean, considering the effects of covid and this pandemic that, you know, I don't think anybody could have dreamed it up, but what are your specific goals on this one? Well, I mean, you can't talk about goals without mentioning COVID and the pandemic, and, and you've mentioned them, of course, in asking the question. And I think it's very important more widely that we don't lose some of the progress that the bar had made in terms of social mobility and in terms of race and so on. I'm very keen that what we started last year with the race working group at the bar shouldn't be left behind. It doesn't just become the meme of 2020. We need to move forward with that. And certainly we've got lots of plans to make sure making the bar a di diverse place and a socially mobile place is not lost as a result of the pandemic. And I think that's a societal change. I mean, lots of organisations are going to be facing the same challenges as a result of the pandemic. So that's a that's a big one. The other, the other areas are really about the effect on the justice system. I mean, most of, most of it seems to have been fairly negative in the short term, but there are some positives and we've had the opportunity to do things in a different way. And we've lived in, I suppose, what you might think of as a large laboratory in terms of technological change, and we've got used to doing it. And there are definitely things which will be useful to carry forward, both into the court system and in the way in which barristers work. So again, I'm determined that we should come out of this with a clear sense of what's worth keeping, what's worth building on, and what we've learned about the things that are important that we need to get back, in particular, how much we do in person, how important it is to have hearings in which people are actually there and feel that they're participating rather than simply viewing through a screen. So all of those things are challenges. They're not unique to the, just the bar. I mean, solicitors have those concerns, the judiciary have those concerns and so on. But we obviously have, as a representative body, have a vital role in making sure that our voice is heard in relation to those things. No, oh, indeed. I mean, life has certainly changed and become in a sort of, you mentioned technology and everything seems to just be online and, and court hearings and appearances and representations. But I have to say, I do feel that a lot of barristers certainly that we work with at red bar law have been fantastic in in just making those adjustments and being available for court hearings online and doing everything online and you know i i, I think that 
they've been really quick. The bar has been really quick, and particularly, as I said, the barristers that we certainly work with to embrace it and find ways to work with it and to deliver their work in the best way they possibly can. And that's that's certainly our experience. Now, this is what I was mentioning earlier when you mentioned your uh, criminal practice background. And I'm going to ask you a bit about the criminal pupillage funding scheme that you introduced, you announced actually on the 14th of December 2020 that the Bath Council has set up. What is it doing to, to support aspiring barristers? Tell us a little bit more about that because I found it really fascinating to read myself. Yes, well, I shouldn't take all the credit. And that's the first thing, because this was a this was a sort of self-generating initiative from um, someone called Lucy Garrett, um, QC at Keating Chambers, who in September, I think, uh, really as a result of her initiative, put together a scheme by which her chambers would support a criminal pupillage that otherwise wouldn't have taken place. And they fairly quickly found someone and so on. And then it became apparent that there was an appetite amongst commercial and construction civil sets for doing something similar. Now, that's not a it's not a scheme that's of application year on year. I mean, the bar shouldn't be um, funding uh, pupillages which are not there because in particular of very poor le- rates of legal aid pay in crime, which is a kind of endemic problem. But this year in particular, we all felt, I think, that the effect of the pandemic would be that people would miss out. We'd have pupillages that didn't happen, pupils that couldn't get pupillages because of the fact that criminal sets were under so much financial pressure. So a number of commercial sets in particular, nine in all, have come together and have agreed to fund pupillages. And they've entered into arrangements with individual criminal sets to provide funding either for a pupillage that wasn't going to happen or an additional pupillage in some cases, so that we can we can try and make sure that the effect on the criminal bar is, is lessened. I mean, we already know there's going to be a fall in pupillages. It's happened this year, and it's going to be disproportionately felt in areas of the bar which have been heavily affected by the pandemic. And that's particularly the criminal bar, because although, as you were saying, lots of other areas can continue remotely, there are particular problems with criminal cases and jury trials in particular, where really there isn't any substitute for all being in the same place, you know, two sides together with a referee and so on, the usual kind of form in which criminal trials take place. So that's the initiative. And it's a bit of a sticking blaster in some ways, but it's a really good example I think, of how people at the bar take the the need to make sure that we don't lose social mobility and that we do support each other seriously. No, indeed. I mean, it's no it's no secret that the criminal bar is is really suffering. And I think with pupillages, I've spoken to a number of pupils myself who have been calling uh, Red Bull or to see whether we can put them in contact with chambers and so on and so forth. And I think one of the biggest challenges is that a pupil will learn by going into chambers and sitting beside and working beside barristers in order to you know do their pupillage and do their training and because barristers are not going into chambers for obvious reasons because of the the pandemic um that's a a, a huge issue so even if you are taken on as a pupil if you're not physically able to attend to a courtroom because obviously there are the courts are still working to some capacity um you can't do your training and um i think that yes there is going to be um you know undoubtedly that that is going to be felt uh, in the in the profession you know the lack of pupils being able to be taken on but hopefully as we come out of this year and I only talk about it as we come out of this year because all of a sudden we're in February um, and before we know it will be you know we'll be at summertime um, and I think hopefully by the time we come out of this year next year there could be um, sort of make up for it in as many ways as possible the profession and, and, and what's being done as as life returns back to the new normal, as I keep referring to it, because I don't know what normal is going to look like. (laughs) No, no. I mean, I think we've got a pretty good idea in the criminal courts, though, that there are some things that you simply can't move online. And as you were saying, it's very difficult to engage in our traditional training model, which really is be there and do stuff or watch stuff being done by somebody who knows how to do it and then start to do it yourself in a small way and build up from there on a regular basis. I mean, that's training at the bar. And it's a very effective form of training, particularly for advocacy. And it's then coupled, isn't it, with the out of court um, skills that we develop in terms of client handling, having conferences, 
how to deal with referral work in a timely way in a high pressure environment when you're also doing advocacy and, and that sort of thing. And those are all things that are, are really best learnt in a sort of hands on apprenticeship, which we've um, traditionally called pupillage. So that works very well. And for obvious reasons, some of which you've mentioned, it's been very hard to do that this year. So, yes, there is a feeling that people have lost out. Lots of people have deferred pupillages and hopefully we're going to be starting in a different position at the end of the year. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. Let's talk about diversity at the Bar Council, Derek. Um, mm. You know, what are you and the Bar Council got planned to do this year to further diversity in the profession? Well, there's a lot going on is the first thing. And there isn't, there isn't a single solution to diversity problems, but I think there is the single starting place. And the starting place is that we can't any longer carry on saying to people, it'll be all right in the end, that in 20 or 30 years time, we might look different and so on. And we can't have that sort of glacial rate of progress. I mean, we need to be doing things at an accelerating pace. And that's, I think, the area where we we need to to begin and having begun there are lots and lots of different things that can be done and we're trying to do them i mean social mobility diversity these things are all interlinked go back to some of the things we were talking about earlier but for example i think there's a there's a, an aspect of this which involves the more senior end of the bar being alive to the problem so one of the things i'm doing is i'm being reverse mentored this year under a scheme which has been set up by the bar, bar standards board which is our regulator and uh, if you if you're not familiar with that what it actually involves in practice is in my case two junior members of the bar one a black man one an asian woman mentoring me throughout the year around issues of race and social mobility wow. so normally i mentor a lot of people who are coming to the bar i've done that consistently over the years and the I suppose the picture you have is of someone who's older and perhaps more experienced and wiser um, giving people um, the benefit of that advice and experience in relation to issues around their career. Well, this is the reverse. This is much younger people who have a life experience, which I don't have and I mean, couldn't really replicate just by reading, but them taking me through the steps which are going to improve my understanding. And that was a scheme put in place last year. I mentioned it in my inaugural address, my beginning of my year really as Bar Council um, Chair. And I'm glad to say that there's been quite a big take up and quite a lot of senior people in leadership positions at the bar are now starting on that scheme to the extent that they're now running out of mentors at the moment and having to recruit others. So wow. I think that's a, that's a really good initiative. But we've also got a, a number of other schemes which have been running for a while. We've got a modernising the bar campaign, an I am the bar campaign, drawing attention to what the bar really looks like. And it's not what people conceive the bar as, as being, really, from a perspective which is a bit old fashioned now. It's a very diverse profession at the bottom end. As I mentioned, we've got a race working group which is doing some fantastic work around making sure that race issues are tackled at the bar. And in particular, that we get comfortable talking about race, which we, we need to do, I think, across society. And we've also got a bar leadership program, which is identifying young members of the bar from all, all backgrounds, but inevitably diverse backgrounds who will be future leaders and actually having a training program. So the sort of programs that really were not there and were perhaps left a chance in the past you know we we think we have to address things in a much more um, constructive and i think organized way and that's what the bar council has been doing as has the our regulator as well and, and other bodies so we're not alone in doing this the inns are there individual chambers are doing it circuits are doing it it's a whole bar effort and it's really ramped up in recent years Excellent. I mean, and the bar also has helplines for equality, diversity and ethics, as well as guides and courses. Um, and there's lots of information on the Bar Council's website about yeah. that, which, you know, um, all sounds really great. I mean, it is fascinating, actually, to sit here and listen for me, particularly that um, outsiders and ethnic groups, people from ethnic backgrounds are 
um, sitting there and saying, right, okay, you slightly old a lot. <laughs> We're here to give you our perspective as, as being an Asian person or a black person or, or a female or somebody with a disability. Um, and it's interesting that, that that's even going on because I'd never imagine it to be that way round in the first place. But, um, you know, I think you said something really important there. We can read all we like, but it's people that have had those actual experiences that when they talk about them, we actually probably can learn the most from people from, from ethnic backgrounds um, rather than yes, just... Yes, I abs absolutely agree with you. I mean, I learning from experience, I mean, almost going back to the way I was describing pupillage is, is the best way to learn, I think. And although... I mean, this isn't the first time I've I've really confronted this, these issues. I had two black women as pupils in the 1990s when I think we were a, a long way uh, away from the strides that we've made since then. And I was frankly amazed and slightly appalled at some of the treatment, completely unconscious, I think, often not, um, not as a result of anything other than well-intentioned comments that they were subjected to on a on a regular basis. I mean, all the sorts of things which we would now identify as microaggressions and unconscious bias and so on, which they and they had a very different experience of the, the bar, I think, at times from people who were white who had to face none of those things. No, indeed. And and it's 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 fascinating to hear because, you know, Joe Public and, and, and I, we don't get to hear these sorts of things unless we have this kind of conversation. So I'm so pleased that we can do that you know, in a relaxed way on, on this podcast. So, okay, let's tell our keen aspiring barristers, what advice, <laughs> Derek, do you have? Now, you you know, you, you, you come from a teaching background and you've told us a lot about, you know, your career's involved a lot of teaching, actually, and a lot of uh, giving and hand-holding. So if I may say so myself, you, you're clearly going to be great for the Bar Council for 2021. I don't need to say that at all, but I will. There you go. I've Thank you. That. So what advice do you have for our, for our aspiring barristers? Well, I've, I mean, I've given a lot of advice to aspiring barristers, I can, I can say. And I think I've sort of come to the conclusion that it's easy to end up with platitudes about being determined and you'll be fine and that sort of thing, which I don't think are very helpful. So I've always tried to be a bit more concrete about things and what most aspiring barristers are interested in is what immediately lies ahead, which is usually qualifying and pupillage and so on. And I think the thing I always start with is that you need to be realistic about pupillage. You need to treat it like a university application, which you all know how to do. You need to have a range of applications. You need to know what your bad day choice is going to be, what your aspirational choice is going to be as well. There's no point always being number three at the top sets and never getting a pupillage. You, you need to cast the net a bit wider and be realistic about the sort of pupillage you're likely to get and where you're going to end up. And that's the point, you need to get one. You don't need to just keep on getting interviews. And the second thing I think that goes with that is that I think you need to be flexible and open-minded about the sort of work that you're going to enjoy doing at the bar. And the, the key point really is that the things that you do academically are simply nothing like those equivalent areas in practice. And you'll find there are very big differences because everything comes with other things that you don't get from the academic side of a practice, in particular meeting people and dealing with people and arguing their cause. And a lot of people who are attracted to certain areas of law in their studies, I think, discover eventually to their surprise that they're actually drawn into really being enthralled by something they never thought they'd be interested in because of everything that goes with it in practice. So those are the first two. I think the, the last two things, which again, I think are, are prag pragmatic advice, are that you need to treat the bar as an exercise in setting up a small business and think about the advice that you would give to yourself if you were setting up a small business, because that's essentially what it is. What would you need to do to make sure that you're organized, to make sure that you're actually earning enough money, that you're dealing with all of the other pressures on your time, that you're thinking about how you continue learning and progressing at the bar, all the things that any small business would think about in terms of increasing its turnover and the work that it does and so on. And I think that's a very good discipline. It's often lost at the bar because younger people start in chambers which are very supportive and collegiate and sometimes they forget actually that 
self-employment means just that, self-employment. You have to look ahead and look after yourself. And I think the final thing I'd say is that you should do other stuff, both within the profession and outside the profession. The people who get on are the people who get involved with their profession, with their specialist bar associations, with the inns, with their circuits. And they're also people who generally tend to have some other interests to keep them sane as well. And those are good things, I think, to take into the bar because it is one of those professions where you can dive in and you can suddenly find yourself coming up for air when you're 35 and think, where did all the time go and what have I actually done apart from going from court to court and doing advice and uh, another bit of paperwork and that sort of thing. So those are the things I think are good practical things to tell young aspiring barristers. Well, Derek, I have to say I'm taking some of that on board myself. <laughs> I, I may not be a young inspiring, aspiring barrister, but no, I think it's some great advice. There's some sound advice. And I think, you know, I've spoken to young uh, law students who don't actually know and they're not aware that working as a barrister, you're a self-employed individual and you have to take care of your own stuff, your own papers in terms of your tax returns, in terms of your workload, going out there and seeing, not just relying on your chambers and your clerks, but seeing, well, how could I nurture relationships with the outside world, whether it's a direct access barrister route you're taking or partly taking, or whether you're looking at law firms and how to establish good relationships in order to grow your practice. Um, and, you know, it, there's a lot to it. And I think that's, that's, really on point and sound advice so, yeah so great advice for anybody who's listening and wishing to come into the uh, world of the bar and what i can say to you is thank you very much for your time today it was really a pleasure to speak to you thank you uh, absolute pleasure for me thanks very much and i'll say to our listeners don't forget to click and subscribe to our podcast and you can find us on instagram twitter facebook linkedin and YouTube by searching Gets Legally Speaking. Also visit our website at getslegallyspeaking.com. Thank you very much for listening.